This recording is an offering of Networks for Training and Development's online university. Hi everyone, this is Rosa McAllister, and this is our monthly Healing Circle call. It's 2 p.m. here in beautiful Hawaii, 8 p.m. Eastern Time in Pennsylvania and other area. And I'm calling to help lead us in this discussion today. This is our monthly call. We make and join together on the first Monday of the month, 8 p.m. Eastern Time, for about 20 minutes, sometimes a little bit less, sometimes a little bit more. It's a time for us to just convene, to gather together, whoever else would like to be together, to take a few moments to breathe together and be together, to enjoy one another's company, and to hold each other in a circle of hope and healing light and belief with one another. You know, so oftentimes we gather together for various reasons, for meetings or for parties or for various issues or items or reasons. But this was designed a number of years ago with folks just asking if we could come together, just whoever wanted to, just quietly breathe together in a way of meditation or prayer or whatever you want to call it in order to just recognize that whether near or far, we are here together, we care about one another. And so we started doing this through networks on a regular basis a couple of years ago, and I personally love this time and look forward to it each month. So this month, um, this call, I'd like to talk about and introduce you, if you're not already familiar with, with one of my teachers. Um, his name is Lama Surya Das, L-A-M-A, Lama Surya, S-U-R-Y-A, Das, D-A-S. And he jokingly refers to himself as the Brooklyn Buddha. He is um, a well-known, internationally known, <clears throat> excuse me, Buddhist teacher. Um, and yet he has this very, first of all, very Brooklyn accent. He is from Brooklyn, New York. And he has this very fun, teasing, um, playful, sarcastic way of talking about life as a practicing Buddhist. He does not call himself lightly a Buddha, and that is part of his jokes. He calls himself a human being trying to be more Buddha-like. Um, as life happens sometimes, and things kind of come at you, or at least for me, and sometimes it's not just the one thing that comes, it's two or three or four until I kind of notice, like, oh my. So I had that interestingly in the last couple of days with Lama Surya Das. He is someone that I've sat in his presence and listened to and um, taken classes with um, over several decades. He is someone that I've read several of his books and listened to his podcasts. And interestingly enough, I just finished rereading one of his books, um, Living in Buddha Time, Standard Buddha Time, excuse me. And as I was driving yesterday to my granddaughter Olivia's first ballet recital, I was listening to NPR, National Public Radio, in my car, and guess who was being interviewed? Lama Surya Das. And I couldn't help but notice the little wink from the universe and listened intently to him and actually pulled over on a couple of occasions and took some notes. And then as I was thinking about what I wanted to talk about today and lead in our few minutes together, I thought, let me talk about Lama Surya Das and what I relearned from him yesterday. He probably has one of the best takes on the idea of meditation that I've heard. And I love the way he talks about meditation and himself and his life because he talks about his imperfections. He talks about his humanness. He talks about his foibles and issues and ongoing struggles with being a human being in this world. But how he talks about meditation, I think, is really, really wonderful. So um, what he said, or how he started, he said that as a young child, playing hide-and-seek outside with his cousins and siblings in both Brooklyn and um, Long Island, Longa Island, as he would say, which is where he was born and then later grew up in Brooklyn, 
He learned a very early meditation lesson, and that was while playing hide-and-seek, if he would stop and simply tune in and sense directly in the immediacy of the moment, he would realize that he became more focused and everything became clearer, much clearer for him. The more he would be able to see and hear, and his cousins and his friends dubbed him the hide-and-seek master because he, people could never find him because at the more he would quiet himself in body and mind, the more he could actually see and hear. Very early meditation practice. He said this was his youthful introduction to the harmony and the oneness available through a heightened, wakeful, as he called it, present awareness. And he said he remembers talking to his bubby, his beloved grandmother. He grew up Jewish in Brooklyn and Long Island um, through his parents' culture and religion. And his bubby, who he adored, his grandmother, he remembered talking with her about this idea of being wakeful, as he called it. He said that it was his idea that he was almost asleep because he was so still, but he was actually more awake than ever and more than his usual. And that's when he could see in the dark and hear things that otherwise he couldn't see or hear. And he also realized that when he became wakeful, as he called it as a child, that's also when problems and other things seem to kind of process themselves out. So, interestingly enough, he has become one of the leading experts on how to meditate. And again, I love his definition and his way about talking about this. He says that um, being mindful, or mindfulness as we now call it, and it's such a buzz, is not much more than just counting to ten before acting, another lesson that he learned well from his buddy as a child, that one should never react or respond in a heightened state of emotion, be it joy or sadness or anger or fear or whatever. And that sometimes the big mistakes we make in our life is when we do just that, when we react without waiting. And the old adage that Bubby taught him to count to ten and to breathe before reacting is another way towards this mindfulness, or as he called it, wakefulness. He also goes on to say that being, quote, one with something, this idea of being one with something is another way of thinking about mindfulness or wakefulness or meditating. And he said that his favorite practice of meditating or being mindful or wakeful is walking his dog. He said that for years, you know, he has two very, very large dogs and they need to be walked at least twice a day. And he said for years, he would kind of think of it as a drudgery or something that he had to go do, especially because he now lives in Massachusetts. And there's hard winters with snow and high winds and some teeming rains and all coldness. So he said one of the things he actively tried to do to bring more wakefulness or mindfulness into his life was this idea of trying to be one with something, to just count to ten, take some time to just do something or not do something. And for him, what he chose to do is to take these two times a day of walking his dog and turn them into his favorite times of day. So he talks about how he would pick out his outfits or pick out initially music he was going to listen to or pick out what time of day or what snack to bring or something like that so that he could more enjoy these times of day. But then he realized what he really needed to do more of is just walk the dog, be one with the dog. And so he started realizing and looking at his dogs at how happy they were. You know, all you have to do is say to a dog, you want to go for a walk? And we all know immediately what they do. They start jumping and licking and panting and smiling and the tail starts wagging and wiggling and because they're happy, because it's a joyful part of their day, maybe the most joyful. And part of it is getting outside and part of it is running a bit and part of it is being with you. And he said when he started looking at that and realizing that he needed to wag his tail a little bit more 
when he walked the dog. That he should have a similar reaction with the thought of, let's go for a walk. And so he started to try to incorporate that and try to build this into his two favorite parts of the day. And he said, that's what's happened. He gets excited, even if it's raining. He has special boots now he puts on, kind of like a little kid, and a raincoat. Or if it's snowy or slushy or cold or hot or whatever the weather or whatever is going on, he tries to build this into, oh, I'm going to wag my tail and I'm going to go out there with my dogs and we're going for a walk. And being one with something and embracing it for what it is. He reminds us that dog, by the way, is God spelled backwards, as we all know. He said that being one with something is the same thing as being with your beloved. You know those moments when you're just with someone that you care so much about that you almost fall into the same breathing patterns. You might not even be talking. You might just be sitting. Maybe you're watching a movie. Maybe it's the quiet before you both fall asleep. Or maybe it's when you hear your beloved beside you falling asleep and they've already, they've already drifted off and you listen to their breathing and it's the moment just before you join them. Or maybe it's early in the morning and you've woken up and they haven't yet. Or maybe it's that time with your child when they're a young one, a baby, and you pop in on them in in their sleep and you just watch them sleep. All of these are examples of being one with something where everything else kind of melts away when you're just literally in the moment in a wakeful state where everything is heightened, your emotions, your awareness, everything. He talks about a very famous Zen master who describes that for Americans, the moment of Zen is a hug. He noted that us Americans, we hug a lot, and that if we would just realize how beautiful and blessed it is, and if we would linger in the hug just a little bit more, how much more mindful and wakeful we would be. Lama Surya Das has played with a lot of words and turning them into verbs because he said that for himself, when he thinks of things and puts them into um, actions, into verbs, they mean more for him and he's more apt to do them more often. So he talks about this idea of awareness and he tells himself to to aware, that is the verb, or be awareing. He adds INGs on a lot of words. Awakening. Be more awakening. Be more smiling. Be more presencing. Be more stilling. Be more quieting. Be more wanting. And he says that for him, that's part of the trick that he plays with himself is, how can I be more one? How can I make it an action, a goal that I'm actually working on? every day. He ends by talking about that all of us should try to be a Buddha. We should try to find the Buddha within us, that smiling, happy guy or girl that's just kind of there, that people want to be with. It doesn't mean that you're happy all the time. It doesn't mean that you're not getting annoyed. It doesn't mean any of that other stuff. Where none of us are that evolved. And he admits that even he isn't. But finding the Buddha inside, in yourself, means stopping, thinking, not reacting, breathing, stilling, presencing, awareing, awakening, minding, and smiling. That's it. There's one last thing that he says he wants us all to remember and to try to do every day, many times every day, maybe an increasing amount each day, is to breathe, relax, and smile. Breathe, relax, and smile. So I leave you with these loving words that I'm sitting here in my car in beautiful Maui, to something in the afternoon and I'm breathing with you. 
I'm relaxing with you. And I'm smiling with you. Sending you so much love and aloha. See you again next month on the first Monday of the month for a healing circle call at 8 p.m. Eastern Time. Thank you for listening. We hope the information provided was helpful. Don't forget to stop by our website and take advantage of all we have to offer.